So we are in Genesis chapter 1. Today we're going to look at the six days of creation. So as we dig into creation, there's some things we ought to note, take note of. Um, first of all, there's six days that God created something, right? God spoke creation into existence. I mean, he spoke and something was formed from nothing. The day God created began in the evening. The Hebrew word for evening is erev, and it means dusk or sunset. So bear in mind when you're planning your days that days, according to God's calendar, begins in the evening, the evening before, right? It goes through the night into the day to the next day at sunset. That's one day. God names his creation, but he allows man to name the animals. And at some point before God created man, he created the angels. In Job we read, When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God, who are the angels, shouted for joy. So what we see in there is that as God's creating, the angels are sitting all around in the bleachers saying, Ooh, ah, God's creating. Right? So we don't know when God created the angels. But they're created to worship God, to serve him. So they could have been created millions of years before the universe, before man. They could have been around. Now, keeping all of that in mind, let's dig into the existence of God in creation. And the simplest evidence of his existence is that God tells us he created everything. And as we look around us, we see his handiwork in everything. So Genesis chapter 1 Verses 3 and 5. Day 1. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. So remember, there was nothing, right? Only darkness. And the first thing God created was light. Now God spoke into the void, and commanded light, and light came forth. Now, we don't know what this light was, but it's separate. He separates the light from the darkness, and it's not the moon, it's not the sun, because he's going to create those later on. But take note, it is a separation here. He feels the need to separate the light from the dark, just as his children are to separate themselves from darkness and walk in the light. And so he names the light day and the darkness night. That completes the first full day. Day 2, verses 6 through 8. God said, let there be expanse in the midst of the waters. Let it be separate. Let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse, separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And, and it was so. And God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening, and there was morning the second day. So the verse says, in the beginning, in the first verse rather, says in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, right? So when he did create them, they were formless and void. So God's kind of filling in the details now as we go from day to day. And at this point in creation, the earth is mostly water. Now some of your translations say firmament, which is raki in the Hebrew, and it means expanse. So a firmament, is a firmament is basically a thin, stretched out layer of space, okay? So on day two, God creates space. But notice where God creates the space. He creates it between or in the midst of the waters. So space divided the waters from the waters, meaning that the above atmosphere, space, God put a blanket or a, a canopy of water. Now, it, that, it, that would have caused the climate on earth to be kind of balmy. It, it was very mild, which, um, which wouldn't have allowed for any violent storms, which would have been the perfect environment for growth, right? Kind of like a greenhouse effect. So this canopy of water would have protected the earth from the constant bombardment of radiation 
that comes from outer space. So you should know, however, that that canopy theory, which it's a theory, is only one of many. Some creation scientists don't believe that the canopy ever existed. But until they come up with a more definitive explanation of the waters above, I'm sticking with the vapor canopy theory. You guys can develop your own theory. Day three. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place. Let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit, in which is their seed, each according to its kind, on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kind, and trees bearing fruit in which their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning the third day. So, God uses day a lot here, doesn't he? In Hebrew, that word for day is yom, and it means a literal day. Notice the first three words of each day he creates is, Then God said. So that indicates that there's a sequence of events here, right? That language, the way it's written, doesn't allow for, the be, for there to be great periods of time in between each day of creation. There's not thousands and millions of days or, or years between creation. Each day of creation follows the last. So there's a very simple reason for that. The earth would have never, creation, we, he noticed he created the trees and the fruit trees and all the vegetation, right? It would never have survived thousands of years later without certain things, okay? So let's put our thinking caps on for a minute. On the third day, which is the day we just looked at, God creates the plants, the trees, the vegetation, and all the seeds to yield more plants and trees and vegetation. Does anyone know how flowers are pollinated? Bees, right? You know how the seeds for trees, do you know how they spread? Wind, rain, other bird, birds, other insects, right? Birds and insects aren't created until the fifth and sixth day of creation. So when God creates the plants and the trees and the vegetation, he creates them full grown. But he creates them with the means to reproduce. He gives them seeds so they can reproduce more of their own kind. Pollination helps the flowers reproduce. And those trees, all that grass, all those flowers, they would need pollination. They would also need sunlight, right? Well, the sun's not created until the fourth day. So what would have happened to all those trees, all those plants, all that vegetation, if there was millions of years between these days of creation? It would be gone. It would be a dust bowl. Now, I'm putting this simply because I'm not a scientist. I was 20 by the time I figured out where babies came from. But creation had to be completed in six days because one system supported the other, right? So it was six literal days, not 6,000 years. Over six days, God forms. He creates all the trees, all the grass, all the flowers out of the matter that he's already created. So it's not until verse 21 that we see that he creates again like he did man. He creates, or the earth rather, in the heavens, bara. We see that again in verse 21. It's when God creates the birds and the sea creatures. And again, we see it in verse 27 when he creates man. So when you take evolution out of the equation, you're only left with one option. God created the universe just like he said he did in six days. So we see God forming and he's shaping. He takes the water beneath the space and forms bodies of water that would later, we know them as seas. He names them as seas. And yet, as yet, there's no shoreline, there's no boundaries. So God causes the dry land to appear, creating the boundaries and the shorelines. He created my favorite place the oceans, where I can go sit on the beach, right? God spoke water. He spoke dry land. He spoke the trees, the grass, the flowers, all of that into existence. And he enabled the trees and the plants and all the vegetation to reproduce in their own kind. And that's what he said. You know, a tree, 
A, a fruit, a, a, an apple tree can't produce an orange tree. A palm tree can't produce an oak tree. A rose cannot reproduce into a lily. And here's the point. God did not create a tadpole, just leave it alone for millions of years, so it would grow into an ape, who would eventually grow into a human being. I'm telling you, it takes more faith to be an atheist, doesn't it? A tadpole can only grow into something of its own kind. An ape can only turn into something of the primate kind. It can't evolve into a man. There's order to all of this. There's planning. There's a design, and that means there is a designer. There's a creator, and the creator is God. God saw what he created, and he said it was good. He didn't wait around and said, hmm, I wonder if that pat tadpole is going to grow into a man or not. I'm going to keep an eye on it for a couple million years. But he said it's good. Good for who? Not good for God, good for us. He made all of this for you and I, for our pleasure, because he loves us. And because he loves us, we can sit under a shade tree on a hot sunny day and be cooled. Because he loves us, we can enjoy the sweetness of an orange or an apple or a pear or some other fruit. Or an Hawaiian donut, which we're all going to probably hit up this week. We'll talk to Danny. Those things provide nourishment for us. They're loaded with nutrients that protect us. God put thought into every single piece of fruit. When you feel the soft grass under your feet, when you lay down on that carpet of green, think about how much God cares for you to give you that comfort, to let you enjoy that. Because he loves us, he's let us live on a land that we can travel on, seas that we can navigate. He's given us resources to build places to live and food to sustain us. The air that we breathe is from God. God created all of this for you and I. And how does man repay that love? They credit random chance for creation. They love the creation rather than the creator. Day four. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let the... Let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And, and it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light to the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good and it was evening and it was morning the fourth day. So God makes another division here. He creates the light, the greater light, which is the sun, and the lesser light, which is the moon. And so the moon begins its rotation, begins its rotation on earth. It begins as a new moon and ends its rotation as a full moon. And we know that the moon affects the daily ebb and flow of all the oceans, right? But that's not all the moon influences. The moon also affects the seasons. It affects the temperatures. And all of that's affected by its gravitational pull. It's responsible for the summers. It's responsible for the winters. Seasons are caused because of the Earth's changing relationship to the sun. The Earth orbits around the sun, sorry flat earthers, once every 365 days, right? So the Earth, as the Earth orbits the sun, the amount of sunlight that's, that falls on each place is different. Each day it changes slightly according to the seasons. So not only does the Earth rotate around the sun every year, but the earth spins in a cycle every 24 hours, completing a full rotation, which, of course, gives us one full day. The earth, however, doesn't spin straight up or down, right? It spins slightly tilted, like some of us are slightly, just slightly tilted. The tilt of the earth is in relation to the sun. It affects the length of the days. Half of the year, the earth is tilted more towards the North Pole or the Northern Hemisphere, and what happens then? We get, hmm? we get summer, spring and summer. The other half of the year, it's tilted more towards the South Pole. What do we get then? Fall and winter. So when that occurs, the days begin to shorten. The temperature begins to get cooler, and of course we get fall and winter. So by creating the moon to rule that space at night and the sun to rule it by day, God also created the seasons. Then he took each star 
and he hung them in place in the heavens. You know, I wonder sometimes if he did in fact take each individual star and hang it in the heavens. It reminds me of Christmas when we used to go to my aunt's house. She loved tinsel. Anybody remember tinsel? Anybody still use tinsel? Can you even buy that stuff anymore? I knew Missy would use it. <laughs> she would take tinsel out of the pack, strand by strand, and lay it on each and every branch. So she was exhausted on Christmas morning. In my house, by contrast, my mother handed my brothers and me the tinsel, and we just took handfuls of it and threw it at the tree. It was like a drive-by tinseling of our tree. So some places on that tree had tons of tinsel. Other places were bare. But to my mother's credit, she never fixed it. She just, it was our masterpiece, and she just let it that way. And that tree went down every year with that tinsel still on it. So it was impossible to get off. Listen, I don't know if God just took hand. I doubt that he took handfuls of stars and just threw them into space. I believe he just hung them there individually. Because everything that God does is done in perfect order. So he put every star where it belonged. So the next time you look up at a full moon or a starlit night, thank God for his creation. When you gaze up the stars, know that, that God had determined exactly where each one should go. He even Scripture tells us he even named them. He determines the number of the stars. He gives to all of them their names. Psalm 147, verse 4. So he hangs them there because he loves us, because he wants us to go out at night and see a beautiful starlit night. All of creation exists because God loves us, and he wants nothing but the best for us. And if you want more proof of his existence, just think of the position of the earth in the universe. God created the earth and placed it perfectly in the midst of the universe. Any closer to the sun, we would roast. Any further from the sun, we would freeze to death. So our position in relation to the sun gives us the right amount of light and warmth. Without light and warmth, the plants couldn't grow. If we were too close to the sun, all the life-giving water on the planet, you ever think of this? All the water would just evaporate, and we would die. If we were too far from the sun, all the water would freeze on the planet. In fact, the fact, rather, that the earth rotates every 24 hours and revolves around the sun 365 days gives us a sustainable environment. If we had long periods of time where a particular face of the earth was turned away from the sun, it would freeze. Scientists call this, actually, they have a name for it. It's called the Goldilocks zone. The Goldilocks zone. In reference, of course, to Goldilocks, whose porch was not too hot, not too cold. It was just right. God has to have a sense of humor. Day five. And God said, let the water swarm with swarms of living creatures. And let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarm according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let the birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. Just consider all the different varieties of birds and insects that are out there. When God spoke, the sea was suddenly teeming with life, with every kind of creature that we see today, including little tiny ones called krill, little, little sardines floating around, right, that you find in cans, but they started in the ocean. Medium-sized fish like salmon, bigger fish like marlin and swordfish, and much larger creatures like whales and plesiosaurus. Yes, God created dinosaurs along with everything else and notice that before God creates these creatures he creates the perfect environment for them to live in the seas were created there was light there was air there was water there was soil there were all the chemicals needed for life the plants the trees the vegetation all these things needed to sustain life were created before he ever created more for life right the birds the the animals the sea creatures and man God said to his prophet Isaiah, For thus says the Lord, who created the heavens, He is God, who has formed the earth and made it. He established it. He did not create it empty. He formed it 
to be inhabited. I am the Lord, and there's no other. So God created the earth. He created it to be inhabited. That's his plan. That was his plan from the beginning, to create the perfect environment and then fill it with life. God created the oxygen and the air that we breathe, the water and the food needed for life. So God created the perfect environment for all the living creatures that he would create. And once the environment was just right to sustain life, God created the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, the hummingbirds, from hummingbirds to whales. He created the crabs and made them delicious. He created the lobsters and made them equally as delicious, the alligators, the sharks. And he also, on this day, for remembrance, created the square fish that McDonald's and Burger King put on their fish sandwich. He created life. He brought them to life. He spoke them into existence. He made them a living, breathing creature. God says, let there be life in the air and the seas. And then he blesses them. And he says, be fruitful and multiply. Now, we don't know how many of each kind of bird and each kind of fish he created. But we know from the flood, from the flood story, that he only needed two, right, of every kind to reproduce all the kinds we see today. So it's possible that there was only a few fish, only a few birds, but they multiplied. And he's not finished creating. Day six. God said, let the earth bring forth creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth according to their kinds and the livestock according to their kinds and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind and God saw it was good. By the way, somewhere in there, God created mosquitoes. And one of the first things I'm going to ask God is, why mosquitoes, Lord? So God created protein on this day. This is the most exciting day in creation for me. He created steak and chicken. Awesome. Interesting, interestingly enough, the meat we consume now, man didn't eat meat until after the flood. They ate, they were vegetarians, right? So God told Noah after the flood, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every bird of the heavens, upon everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered. Every moving thing that lives shall be, good for, for, shall be food for you, as I give you the green plants, I give you everything. Best verse in the world. God gave Noah permission to eat steak. <laughs> Prior to this, as I said, man ate fruits and vegetables, not meat. And even the animals ate fruits and vegetables, not each other. So animals are created, they're brought forth from the earth. Like man, they're formed, I believe, from the dust of the earth. When they die, they return to the dust of the earth. And I want to point out another interesting fact about creation, the variety that God has created. Think about how God created the smallest little guppy or sunny to the largest whale. They couldn't be more different, yet they are all of the same kind. They're all sea creatures, right? He created the turkey vulture, the hummingbird, different birds, yet they're still birds. The chihuahua is a dog, or at least I think that's a dog. <laughs> But then there's St. Bernard's and Mastiff's, right? They're huge compared to a Chihuahua, and the Chihuahua usually bosses them around. And although they're different, they're of the same kind, right? They are of the canine kind, just like wolves and foxes and coyotes. All right, listen, I did not want to include them, but God did make them. Anyone want to guess? Cats. 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 Lions, tigers, leopards. Cheetahs, saber-toothed tigers, they're all of the feline kind. He created the cows and the horses, horses being the other meat, right? Apes, bears, duck-billed platypuses. On this day, he creates the elephants, the woolly mammoths, the dinosaurs, all the beasts of the earth. And I'm glad, glad, I'm glad God has a sense of creativity because his creation is not dull and it is not boring. Have you ever walked out in nature? Have you ever just walked around a park and you just look around and enjoy the, the different bushes and the plants and all the different things that you see and you're enjoying the insects unless there's a bee after you 
the birds. If you just look, you could see his creation everywhere. Look at us. I mean, we have noses, ears, ears and teeth, right? To varying degrees, we have teeth. And hair, also to varying degrees. But we're all the same. We're all the same. We're, we're all of one kind man, but there are no two people in this room alike. Unless you have a twin here with you. But there's no one else quite like you. And I know some of you personally, and I can assure you of that. Do you realize how mathematically impossible that is? You're unique, just like a snowflake. I'm not saying you are a snowflake. I'm saying you're like a <laughs> snowflake, that no two snowflakes are alike. You realize how mathematically impossible that is. But, of course, all of this happened by random chance. God created, and he created with a variety you know, in his letter to the Ephesians, Paul wrote about God's manifold of wisdom. And, he, and that word manifold means varied. It's, it's the same meaning where Joseph's coat of many colors, that's that same meaning. So it's evident. God's creation, God is evident in his creation, in the variety of his creation, even evident in God's church. Because the church is made up of many different people, many different races, colors, and it doesn't... It doesn't look, God doesn't look at the covering of, of what we look like on the outside. He looks on the inside. He looks at our heart because we're all God's creation. And God's creation, all of his creation, even mankind, reflects his manifold wisdom. So on this day, God creates the insects. And the show, the further show, the creativity of God, he creates something called a bombardier beetle. And I, I, I singled this one out because my son Brian was excited to tell me about this one yesterday. I never heard of a, a bombardier beetle or what it did, but it's amazing. This insect has gained popularity among scientific circles because of the chemicals that it sprays. It sprays a caustic mixture. There's two separate chemicals within this insect. And when it gets attacked, it mixes them together inside of itself and sprays it out on its enemies. Scientists are baffled how this beetle could store these caustic chemicals within it and not destroy itself in the process. They have no idea how this happens. So I'm going to read you an article from Science and Faith magazine. It is still a great mystery to researchers how an insect can harbor inside itself a powerful system potent enough to trigger a chemical reaction that could easily cause it harm while also isolating itself from the effects of that system. No doubt the existence and working of this system is too complicated to be attributed to the insect itself. It is still a matter of discussion how the bombardier beetle makes such a system work within its tiny body, measuring about two centimeters in length, when human experts can only perform it in laboratories. The only apparent truth here is that this insect is concrete example completely refuting the theory of evolution because it is impossible for this complex chemical system to have been shaped by a series of coincidental variations and passed on to future generations, even a minor deficiency or defect in a single piece of this system would leave the animal defenseless so that it would soon be killed, or it would cause it to blow itself up. Therefore, the only explanation is that the chemical weapon in, their in, in this insect's body had come into being with all its parts, all at once, and without defect and the conclusion to be derived from this example is that God has created all living beings uniquely and without any prior example if you it could have only been designed this way from the very beginning so if you want to know if God truly exists it's all around us it's in creation look at the animals look at the sea life look at the insects and you will see a master designer at work you will see God in all of creation. And that's what Paul writes. He says, for this invisible, for his invisible attributes, rather, namely his eternal power and divine nation, divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since creation of the world and the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. Just looking at creation, looking at my favorite bird, the woodpecker, looking at this bombardier beetle that you learned about today. You can't help but walking away knowing that it had to be designed that way. And if it was designed that way from the beginning, there had to be a designer. And so you have no excuse for not believing.
Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 through 27. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. We're still on day six. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. We are made in the image of the Godhead. God said, let us make man in our image, referring to the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We are made in God's image. We have the same characteristics of God. We have a personality. We can think. We can, we're able to reason. We're able to, to obtain knowledge. We have feelings. We have emotions. We have a will. The trees, plants, the fish, or the animals, they have no free will. Trees and plants have no feelings. I don't know if they feel it when you hug them or not. As humans, we're set apart from the rest of creation. We're made in the image of our creator. We have morality. We know right from wrong. We can make moral judgments. We have a conscience. We have spirituality. Man was created with a desire to know God. We are body, soul, and spirit, so we can connect spiritually with God. Our spirit is eternal, and if we are in Christ, we will spend all eternity with him. So we've been made in the image of our creator. Verse 28, and God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish and the sea and over the birds of the heavens and every living thing that moves on the earth. So God created the earth, and then he gave man control of it. God gave man stewardship over the earth, and we've done a horrible job with stewardship of this earth, haven't we? And as we're going to see, mankind will lose his dominion over the earth to the enemy, Satan. The fall of man changed everything. But when God first created the earth and everything on it, God gave man dominion over it. So God now, God had dominion over it, gives it to man. So we still have, to some extent, the animals still fear us, unless you get in the middle of the woods and there's a grizzly bear. Verse 29, and God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. To every beast of the earth, and to every bird of heaven, to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. It was evening, and it was morning, and the sixth day. So again, prior to the flood, we're vegetarians. Prior to the flood, animals are vegetarians. And perhaps there was a design in that as well. It gave the animals time to reproduce. I mean, my son asked me a question one time, which just blew me away. Uh, my son's not a believer. And so he said, there was an ark, right? I said, yes, there was an ark. He said, there were wolves on the ark, right? I said, yes, there were types of wolves on the ark, right? He said, there were sheep on the ark, right? I said, yes, there were sheep, types of sheep. He said, well, the, the wolves get off the ark, the sheep get off the ark, no more sheep, but yet they're sheep. Great argument, right? But God, but God, they were vegetarians. He would never believe that, but they, ate, they were vegetarians. They didn't, they didn't eat. The lions didn't eat the other animals. The wolves didn't eat the other animals possibly as long as it took for them to reproduce in numbers great enough. I mean, they could probably start eating rabbits right away. Two rabbits, probably, there was 5,000 of them got off that ark, so. <laughs> but unless that happened, we'd be missing quite a few species of animals, wouldn't we? God saw that all he had created was indeed very good. And so we complete another full cycle, day into morning, the sixth day of creation is complete, and God is going to rest on the seventh day, and Lord willing, we'll look at that next week. So God created the life all around us. He made it all for us to enjoy and to sustain us. Everything he did, he did with us in mind. Everything he created, he created out of love for us. I don't know about you, but I fail in my love for him every day. I fail at loving him with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my strength, and all my mind. But he never fails in his love for us and that is ever so present in his creation there's no doubt that God exists 
His existence is everywhere in creation. And so at the end of the notes, again, I gave you a couple more examples of a, of a blue butterfly and a flying spider. Again, amazing creations of God that speak of his existence, that speak of a designer because they could not have evolved into what they are. And so if you're ready to accept, accept the truth that there must be a designer, then you must accept the fact that there is a God. And if God exists, it's time for us to start obeying his word. And that begins by surrendering to Jesus. And that is as simple as ABC. Admit you're a sinner. The Bible tells us there's none righteous, no, not one. For we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. And God knew that we were going to fall. God knew it was going to happen in the garden. He knew mankind would give in to the wiles of the enemy. And so before the foundation of the earth, he already had a plan to send his only begotten son to die for our sins on the cross. So God already had a plan to solve man's sin problem. And so the next part of the ABCs of salvation is B, believe that. Believe that Jesus died for our sins. Believe that he rose from the grave, that he's coming again in glory to judge the living and the dead. Romans 10, verses 10 and 11 says, For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes will not be put to shame. Listen, you can look at creation all day long. You can look around and see all of this and see God in it and still deny God. But one day you're going to stand before him. And you're going to see the existence of God right before your very face. And by then it's going to be too late. He gives us every opportunity while we still have breath in our lungs to realize that there is a God and to accept his son as our Lord and Savior. So that brings us to see. Call upon Jesus. Confess you can't do this on your own. Confess that you need him because no one can work their way into heaven. Paul says that if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, we will be saved. So I pray that creation is the, is the thing. Listen, I love this stuff as much as I love prophecy because it, God's all through this. His signature is on every single thing we see every day. And if you can't see God in this, then you can't see God in anything. Please stand.